I'm a distributed systems researcher at heart. And uh, if you'd asked me, you know, 10 years ago, uh, what I would have to say about um, the post more era or accelerators, I would have had no idea because that wasn't a topic that I thought was going to be relevant to distributed systems uh, immediately. But it turns out that it actually has changed things uh, quite substantially. So if you care about performance of distributed systems, and you should because just about everything these days is a distributed system, uh, the move to a post more accelerator oriented world has caused uh, a lot of things that didn't used to matter to be um, really at the forefront. You know, a, a long time ago, if, you're, if your database was doing complicated processing on a CPU and accessing a really slow disk, it didn't really matter uh, exactly how your protocol worked. Uh, a lot of this stuff mattered in the wide area, but not so much in the cluster environment. But now we've really sped up single node performance and distributed systems performance comparatively is lagging. So, you know, to illustrate this gap, we've always known that there was a cost to doing things in a distributed environment. So these are just some random numbers from a pretty conventional key value store implementation that I did uh, five, seven years ago, something like that. Um, and as you can see, we, we get some reasonable performance on a single node, but the, we drop to 16% of that performance once we start doing replication to be fault tolerant on a distributed cluster. And if we want to start doing transactions in order to support um, consistency in a multi, uh, in a multi server environment, that's even more expensive. But a lot has changed, you know, in, in, in the intervening years. So if we compare to some of the latest results from the last couple of years, um, and I should point out two things about this. Uh, the first off is that I'm mixing and matching results from different experiments and different papers. So if you're looking for scientific rigor, you're not going to find it on this slide. Um, and the, uh, the second is that um, these graphs are not even remotely on the same axis, right? The one on the right is in millions and the one on the left is in thousands. But the point I really want to get across here is that uh, the um, the uh, the gap between the single node and distributed performance has gotten even larger, and we also see this in applications that really you wouldn't think of as um, traditionally distributed systems bound. So even a really CPU intensive application like training deep neural networks, we've had a huge speed up of this in the last five years. Um, just using standard cloud CPU stuff, performance has increased uh, by 17 and a half X on one DNN training workload. But in a multi-node environment, we've only seen a 40% improvement in the throughput. So what's happening here? Well, precisely because we have all of these new accelerators in the data center and new technologies like memory, we've sped up single node performance so much that we're starting to see a that distributed systems are now the, uh, the bottleneck. So the question for us is, is there going to be a distributed systems accelerator and what is that gonna look like? So in this talk, I wanna argue that we can have such a thing using in-network computation, using some devices that we already have in our data center environments. Uh, these include uh, programmable switches, programmable network cards, uh, and things that were originally designed to support new network protocols, but that can have some powerful applications to distributed systems as well.
So the plan for this talk is that um, I will talk a bit about the devices we're using here and some of the principles that we can use in order to um, use in-network computation effectively, and then talk about three applications as examples of how we can do this. And I'll wrap up with some conclusions and future research directions. So in, in terms of um, platforms, uh, there are a bunch of different options available, um, ranging from programmable switches like the Barefoot Tofino to smart NICs like the Microsoft Catapult, and also multi-core network processors and other architectures. Generally speaking, we've got a trade-off here between devices with higher throughput and ones that have more computational capability. Uh, in this talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on putting computation into the switches, which effectively ties us to the programmable switch ASIC model, um, though we have some other work going on in using the other categories. So just to briefly give an overview of these devices, um, these switches are uh, programmable devices that follow the pattern of a traditional networking pipeline, but have flexibility in terms of what they can do. So in particular, there is a programmable parser that can look at application-defined headers. There are reconfigurable logic stages that let us do custom processing on those devices, or on those, on those headers, and uh, a small amount of on-die memory that uh, lets us do stateful computations. The really important thing about this is that this is an architecture that's really powerfully optimized for packet processing. Um, it can do this processing at line rate, running it up to 12 terabits per second. And if you know, you've thought about how to build a system on a CPU that keeps a 100 gig link active, um, this should uh, be a really impressive number. But it's also a pretty terrible general purpose computer um, because the amount of processing that we're able to do in order to use it uh, is limited to, you know, a small handful of ALU operations on each packet and on the order of tens of megabytes of memory. Not to mention the fact that, like all accelerators, it's more complicated to develop applications for it uh, and to deploy it. So what that means is that uh, although it can be te tempting, to try to offload applications just directly into the device and use this ASIC uh, to run applications, it's pretty unlikely that this is going to match the resource constraints of the device. So uh, what we want to do instead is really think about what the fundamental aspects of the distributed systems are that we want to accelerate and define some network primitives uh, in order to support that. In order to um, understand which applications are a good fit here, uh, we've put together a taxonomy that classifies applications based on effectively two things. One is how many operations and how much memory are required, uh, which let us determine whether it's feasible to put something into a switch, and then uh, whether we get a benefit from it, which can be effectively worked out by uh, understanding whether we uh, Send, whether, we're able, whether we get a benefit from putting the computation into the center of the network, um, whether we can fundamentally change the number of rounds of communication or the number of the ratio of packets being sent to packets being received. We'll see this in a few applications. So I want to talk about a couple different applications here. Uh, obviously, these are all projects that have uh, been done with a, a wide number of collaborators. Um, and that all address different distributed systems challenges. So the first one is uh, state machine replication for building fault tolerant systems. We all know that computers crash and that we need the system to be robust to it. So what we like to do is run multiple copies of our application on different replicas, make sure that they're running the same operations in the same order, such that if one fails, the system uh, continues to work. Classically, the way we've ensured that we're running the same operations in the same order 
is by using a distributed algorithm called Paxos, which in its common case, we've got a client sending a request to a leader replica, which assigns it an order, contacts a quorum of the other replicas, waits for responses, and once they've recorded it, it can go ahead and execute the operation and reply to the client. So there's a bunch of complexity in this. In the common case, there's four message delays in order to run the, run the protocol, and there's a bottleneck replica that's processing a lot of messages. So if we think about why this is an expensive algorithm to run, uh, it comes down to a lot of assumptions that people traditionally make in distributed systems, uh, where we treat the network as an adversary that drops packets at the worst possible time. And so what we were asking in this work is whether this assumption still makes sense in a world of data centers, and in particular programmable networks where we can actually change things about the algorithm, about the network. So we're asking, you know, what properties could, a net, could an ideal network provide? On, on the one extreme, we've got what we've got, what we have now, an asynchronous network where we have to run um, the full complexity of Paxos in order to um, get things to work. Um, at the other extreme, we have a, we could imagine a totally ordered network where uh, the network effectively runs a Paxos-like algorithm in order to do the ordering itself. Um, and that kind of falls into the trap of trying to um, accelerate an entire application versus something more um, fundamental. So we started asking was, um, is there a middle ground where there are useful benefits but an efficient implementation? And what we found in a project called Network Ordered Paxos was that you could do very well by using the network to provide ordering through a network sequencer at abstraction, but not try to provide reliability. The approach uh, in terms of networking is quite simple. We're going to designate as one of the switches as a sequencer and make sure that all of the uh, replication traffic is going through all of these, um, is going through this one switch where we will then go and uh, increment the counter on every request, write that into the value of a packet header, and we can use that in order to detect when messages are dropped. So what this lets us do is to implement a new protocol called Network Ordered Paxos, where we're relying on the network to provide the sequencing in the common case. Rather than have to go through a multi-round protocol where the replicas talk to each other, the client sends the request directly to uh, all of the replicas, and they verify that the sequence number applied by the network is the next one in sequence. And if it is, they can go ahead and execute it and respond back to the client. And the client can check that there are matching responses. And as you can see, this is a two message delay protocol all versus four, and it doesn't have the, bottom, the communications bottleneck we saw before. Obviously, there's a lot of complicated things that can go wrong. Um, messages can get lost, replicas can fail, the leader can fail, the sequencer switch can fail. Um, all of these things are problems. I won't go into how we solve them, but it's, it's typically done using um, techniques like we would have with um, traditional distributed protocols. Um, but the benefit that we get out of it is um, better performance, both in terms of latency and in throughput. So traditionally in algorithms like this, you've had a trade-off between um, things that were providing better, better latency through optimized protocols and batching techniques that gave you better throughput. And with network ordered Paxos, we're able to give you both of these at once. In particular, uh, we're able to compare against an unreplicated system, uh, which isn't doing any replication at all. And we get performance that is nearly identical to that, which isn't particularly surprising because thanks to the use of the network sequencer, uh, we're able to run a protocol where the replicas don't have to talk to each other in the common case. So to summarize the network ordered Paxos part of this talk, uh, it's a new approach to providing state machine replication based on co-designing the distributed system with a network, and in particular using in-network computation for the sequencing. So this is a good example of our strategy of 
um, identifying a common primitive, the sequencer, but relying on distributed protocols for the rest of the application um, logic. And doing so lets us fundamentally change the communication properties of the application and get us better latency and better throughput. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, training machine learning workloads and their communication bottleneck. So you might find it a bit strange that I'm talking about a network bottleneck in machine learning because surely this should be the most computationally bound workload of all. Um, and, it, and indeed, this is a very computationally intensive um, workload. But the reason we've been so successful with ML is that we can process huge data sets, which we can only do on distributed clusters. And unfortunately, distributed training hasn't kept up with the speed up on a single node, as we saw at the beginning of the talk. So what's been happening here is that GPU speeds have been increasing dramatically um, in the last five years. And we're seeing you know, new types of accelerators that are not GPUs that are even faster coming into play. Um, but as we deploy these, we often can't upgrade the data center network. The network isn't speeding up at the same rate. So what's happening if you look at um, a particular workload is the fraction of time that the application spends doing actual processing on the GPU compared to the time that it is waiting on the, on the network for data to be exchanged um, has been changing dramatically. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing that we are bottlenecked on the network. So why is this? Well, if you think about the kind of batch parallel training that we usually do for, for um, large scale uh, ML training workloads, we're alternating um, computation and communication phases. So each worker has a, a fraction of the training set and in one, in one computation phase, the GPUs are all going to think about what, uh, what, what about how, they, how to, how to um, update the model based on their data, but then they need to stop and synchronously exchange with each other uh, all of their updates to the model uh, before they can start the next phase. And conceptually, this is an all-to-all -all communication where they're exchanging a, a vector of model updates and, and adding them together. Um, obviously, we wouldn't necessarily implement it using a literal all-to-all -all communication. We could also do it using various types of tree, tree or ring reductions or a parameter server. But at, at any, in any case, you have a, a latency cost to doing that and a network uh, communication cost. And this is actually a fairly substantial amount because we are talking about exchanging vectors that are on the order of hundreds of megabytes of data uh, from you know, potentially dozens of workers uh, and as the GPUs get faster, the communication, the, 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 the computation time decreases. So we start pushing the training bottleneck to the network. And uh, as you can imagine, we are asking um, in this project whether there's something we can do with in-network computation to help with this. Um, not surprisingly, there is. Uh, what we're doing is leveraging the fact that we don't actually need to exchange the entire model which update from every of the workers, we just need to compute their sum. And that's exactly the kind of computation you could do quite effectively if you had a device in the middle of the network that could um, perform this computation. Now, there's a lot that we have to do in order to make this work efficiently. Um, most of it comes down to the fact that even though we're just adding numbers together, uh, they're quite large vectors of floating point values, and that's really putting um, a strain on the network, on the network device. So in particular, because we can't fit the entire um, vector on the switch at one point, we have to run a streaming protocol where each worker sends pieces of their, their vector to the switch, which waits for each of them, which waits for that to come in from all the workers, then performs the aggregation, sends out the result, and lets us send out, start the aggregation of the next piece of the vector. 
Um, and that means that we have to implement a, a set of new flow control algorithms to make this happen, uh, as well as algorithms to recover from packet locks. The other challenge is um, supporting new numeric, represent new numeric representations. This is a vector of floating point values, and we've got a switch that is designed to do simple integer operations. There are a lot of different ways to address this, and we've actually tried most of them. Um, they include converting the floating point values to fixed point, implementing floating point conversion on the switch itself, and trying out new numeric representations like block floating point. Um, it turns out that they all can be made to work. They have different trade-offs for cost and convergence, um, convergence time versus uh, resources on the switch. And one of the nice things about using programmable network devices is that we get the chance to experiment with these things rather than having to uh, bake a particular um, strategy, a particular numeric representation into the ASIC design. To give a, a couple of very uh, preliminary results on this, um, we've tried this on a, a cluster of eight nodes um, at, on, a, on several uh, neural networks, and we see speed ups ranging from 20% to 300%. The variance in this depends on a lot of factors that ultimately boil down to what the ratio of computation to communication is in a particular workload. Um, and that depends on the structure of the neural network as well as the relative um, performance of the GPUs in the network. But we expect the latter to get much worse and to make this much more valuable as we start seeing larger clusters with faster GPUs, but the same network speeds. So to summarize um, this, this project, uh, even compute intensive workloads nowadays are being bottlenecked on cluster communication. So there's really an opportunity to accelerate a common communication pattern uh, using in-network aggregation. And that can get us uh, some substantial speed ups that become pretty important as, uh, as GPUs and other accelerators make communication faster. So finally, I'd like to talk a bit about um, another distributed systems challenge of load balancing. So we know that in life, as in distributed systems, we've got some users that are really popular and some users that are not so popular. And the set of things that are popular changes with the trends as increasingly random things become popular for no apparent reason whatsoever. What that means in terms of distributed systems is that if we're gonna build a storage system to support these types of workloads, that some of the nodes are gonna be much more heavily loaded than others. A server that's, if we just use hashing to partition users to different servers, the server responsible for a really popular user is gonna be highly overloaded, whereas the server for a less popular user will have a lot of spare computational capacity. And what that means is that if we want to um, provide predictable latency and performance, we're going to need to vastly over-provision the system because it needs to support these really popular users, even if they're not uh, the normal case on all the servers. So there's a, a variety of ways to address these. Some of them like caching are getting increasingly hard to do as we increase the performance the performance of the baseline system using new accelerators. What we're looking at doing instead is um, a, a selective replication approach where we take the really popular users and put them on multiple, multiple servers, potentially even all of them, which lets us spread out the load a bit more evenly um, by sending it to different servers. And I should point out here that we are talking about not replication for fault tolerance as we were earlier, in the, er, earlier, but now we're looking at replication for performance as a way to um, spread the load within a um, rack level server architecture. So the question of course for replication is how many objects should we replicate? Um, 
there's a trade-off between replicating more objects, which increases storage overhead and communication overhead when we do writes, and um, getting better load balancing properties. It turns out there's a really nice theoretical property here, um, which is that you can get provable load balancing guarantees for a cluster if you replicate just the most popular n log n objects and forward read requests to the least loaded replicas. Um, and kind of surprisingly here, n in this context is the number of storage servers. So this is independent of the number of objects in the system. Uh, and in practice, for the kind of cluster sizes we've been working with, uh, n order n log n is a pretty small number, um, including uh, you know, for racks of uh, 64 servers. Now, how we implement um, this replication is pretty challenging on a number of levels. We need to know which are the popular objects that we need to replicate. And we also need to know when a request comes in, whether it's for one of these objects that's been replicated, and if so, which servers are storing the data. And we need to know which of those servers is the least loaded. And there's you know, the always complicated problem of keeping replicas consistent as these objects change. So the answer that we came up with in order to address these is an in-network coherence directory. So if you're coming from an architecture background, as I imagine many of you are, coherence directories are something you know very well. Um, it's just a directory placed in the cache management system of a multi-core or system that tracks where the cached objects are and what state they're in. And we use that to build the coherence protocol. So this fits really nicely with uh, an in, an in network design because we can use a switch data plane to act as exactly one of these coherence directories, um, keeping track of which objects are very popular and where they're located such that when a request comes in, we can look it up in the directory and decide where to send that request. It also gives the switch the opportunity to rebalance the cluster by noting that one server is being overloaded and moving the object the next time a write comes in, which you can do safely as long as it just updates the directory and sends the, the next reads to the same location. Uh, there's a number of challenges uh, in, involved in implementing this, uh, including making it fit in, the, in a data plane, uh, keeping track of server load, and building a, a, a coherence protocol that handles writes correctly, uh, all of which uh, we've addressed, but I won't have time to talk about today. Um, but the point I want to make here is that this lets us handle, in a rack scale storage system, load balancing uh, in a really nice way. So if we consider workloads with different levels of skew, represented here by uh, different, different ZIF coefficients, um, and we're gonna go from a uniform distribution to a very skewed ZIF 0.9 uh, uh, over into a extremely highly skewed uh, distribution that kind of matches the worst you see in uh, social network skew, pop skew. And we try to build a system that uh, maintains a predictable latency um, SLA. Then, uh, as you can see, there's the amount, the, the total throughput of the system really drops as we get to these more skewed workloads because the servers that are holding popular objects uh, make up an increasingly large part of the load and they become increasingly overloaded. If we deploy Pegasus, our system with the in-network coherence directory, in order to replicate these objects, we can get a, a major throughput improvement uh, for the uh, highly skewed workload, which means that we can reduce the number of servers that we need in order to, to um, meet that latency S SLO by uh, a, a factor of uh, eight or so. Um, and get throughput, even though we have a very highly skewed workload that looks as though we're running a, a uniform workload. All right, so to summarize this last project, skewed workloads are giving us server load imbalances and 
if we had the flexibility to place objects wherever we wanted in the cluster, that would be really efficient for rebalancing it. But um, keeping track of where the data is located uh, and getting requests to the right place is a really challenging problem. But the programmable switch is really nice here because we're able to run custom application level logic that is making a decision on every packet for where to send it, uh, which combined with our coherence directory approach lets us do this really fine grained per request load balancing that we want. All right, so let me recap what I've been saying for this talk, which is that as single node performance gets faster, driven by accelerators and new technologies, distributed systems problems are increasingly the bottleneck. And we can use in-network computation to accelerate common communication patterns. We've seen replication, collective communication, load balancing. Uh, these are all cases where we think that we're really getting a benefit from moving a simple piece of the uh, design into a switch, which lets it leverage both its really high throughput capacity and its ability to do this computation in the center of the network. Um, in each case, we've had to carefully design these primitives um, at co-designed with the distributed system itself. So I want to talk now about a couple problems that I think the community should be thinking a bit more about, uh, particularly this community, the SPMA um, architecture community. And a lot of these are things I think we've been seeing throughout the workshop already. Uh, so the first one is what should these accelerators look like? We've been using programmable switches um, because they're available and they're fast. Uh, but obviously these were devices that were designed to support networking applications like routing and congestion control and load balancing. Uh, and in a sense, as systems researchers, we're taking this device and abusing it to support new applications. So there's good reason for us to do that, obviously. We want to use hardware that actually exists if we want to measure it. But what would a future device that's designed to serve as a distributed systems accelerator look like? And the question you know, we'd really want to think about there is uh, there's a lot of compute and storage limitations that go into building a high performance device. Which of these are fundamental? You know, for example, it seems unlikely that we'll have really fast access to huge amounts of memory, but we might be able, if we had wanted to, to provide more compute capacity, which is something that just the networking applications didn't particularly need. And in terms of uh, operating system support, we have a lot of things that I think the accelerator community has looked at in the context of FPGAs and GPUs, but we haven't thought about in, for in-network devices. So what, what kind of isolation mechanisms do we need if we wanna be able to support multiple applications running at the same time, sharing resources, or even going further to think about multiple cloud tenants that might wanna bring their own in-network primitives, but yet have very strong security requirements because they don't trust other customers. The other question is, uh, what kind of higher level abstractions do we want to try to provide um, in network primitive developers with? Right now they're accessing the device directly. Are there things like a file system that you know, an operating system would typically provide that would make sense to have here too? We've started thinking about some of these questions, but I think you know that in the past, we've been limited by the fact that we haven't really known what the applications are. Now we're starting to figure that out a little better uh, and, it's, and it's time to think about these a bit more. Let me wrap up by thanking um, a, a number of collaborators who worked on um, these systems. Obviously they were um, large collaborative projects involving um, my colleagues at MSR, my students at UW uh, and collaborators elsewhere, including um, Kaust and Johns Hopkins. And I'll leave you with this thought, which is that uh, distributed systems and accelerators are things that we really have to think about together now in today's cluster environments. That uh, if we care about performance, 
of accelerators and we're going to be using them in distributed clusters, we need to think about the distributed systems. If we're going to think about performance of distributed systems and we're using accelerators, then we've really improved the single node performance in a way that means we have to think about the performance of the whole system a little bit differently. Uh, and that we're going to need new types of accelerators to support distributed systems uh, in network computation gives us a way of doing that. Thanks. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a great talk. And uh, I uh, would encourage people to raise hands and ask questions. So Muhammad, uh, please go ahead. I unmuted you. Um, hi. So I had a, a couple of questions on some um, overheads I, I thought of when you were describing these acceleration applications. And I sort of wanted to know whether they're like something which is fundamental or something that can easily be solved. So one of the things is like when you were considering switch ML, so I thought that like, you know, if I want to have an application that does all to all communication, I would try my best to um, reduce most of the data I send either through compression or by trying to pa pack in as many of the data points into one packet. On the other mm -hmm. hand, you also mentioned that your switch has a limited number of ALUs. And so I was assuming uh, like, so on one hand, you have a switch that has a limited number of ALUs. So I'm assuming it can read a limited amount of the packet. And on the other hand, you wanna fill in as much of your data in packets as possible. You wanna do complex compression. And I was wondering if, if, if this, is, this is something that becomes an issue uh, as, you, as you increase the number of uh, the amount of data you communicate. Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. This is a trade-off that we see. Um, I think you're saying two things, um, and I, I, I agree with both of them, that one of them is that um, if we want to get strong utilization out of our network, we need to use large packets, which is something that uh, existing programmable devices are not really well suited for. Um, and, and yes, this is an issue that, um, the, the switch can only process a certain amount of um, a, a certain a certain fraction of a, a certain amount of data in each packet, uh, and you know if you limit yourself to sending hundred byte packets, um, that's going to limit you, you know it's it's you're you're maybe going to get seventy eighty percent utilization on the network just because of framing overhead, uh, and I think yes that's exactly a case where. Uh, as I was saying, we might want to think about how to design these devices for uh, use as distributed systems accelerators versus um, networking networking devices. Uh, so we have actually gone to some uh, great effort in order to support larger packets through um, various kinds of abuse of the underlying hardware. And this does give us some important performance benefits. Uh, the other thing you were talking about is whether um, compression, gradient compression uh, and, and other things can help us out here. And uh, again, I think, yes, there's a trade-off between the complexity of the algorithm you'd like to run and uh, what you can do in, in the hardware. Um, one of the things we've seen is that, um, you know, compression of, of gradients that uh, taking advantage of the sparsity, um, these things are useful, uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, the computation cost of performing the compression it, it adds up even on the even on the end host, not even within trying to get it into the switch. Uh, so I think there's you know a spectrum of approaches you'd want to use here, and it might it, it might very well depend on your cluster and your workload. Thanks a lot. Uh, so yeah, so Antoine, uh, <clears throat> you go ahead. Yeah. So thanks for a great talk, Dan. So I have one question, and uh, you gave me a great segue into that question. So speaking of cost on the end host, um, and I think this also fits in the context of this workshop. So the end host is also a distributed system, right? So you're running on multiple cores, there's loads of trade-off, and you're going out on this one serial link you have to coordinate, does each course send out stuff individually? Do you first pull stuff together? And it strikes me that a lot of the you know, constraints you have there when, when you're doing this are similar to what you 
what you see in the distributed systems setting, right? So especially if, if smartNICs come into the picture, right? Then you have a kind of an additional uh, serialization point where like suddenly this looks very much very similar to what you did on the switch, right? You have your multiple cores all connected to your one NIC, and then you can do uh, you have a global view there, right? Uh, which would be more expensive to to get on the software side. So have you thought about how this or if 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 any of your techniques would would also fit in there or what could more generally what this means for the end host? Uh, not, not specifically, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an important question that, um, you know, the, the, the end host is going to be a distributed system too, that communication between the cores matters um, and how we set up the interconnect matters as well as how we communicate um, across, across cores. I don't have, you know, enough of a architectural background to say much that's useful about, uh, you know, what kind of uh, abstract of primitives you'd want for cross core communication. Um, but it's, so it's, I think I'm more thinking about this just in terms of like, well, you have these cores and they're talking to other cores outside. Right. So there's a question of how do you get out to the network and there's various options to like first coordinate within like on the cores yeah. and then go, go, go out to the network in a coordinated way. Do you do this individually? Do you do this on a smart neck, uh, in that setting? Yeah, yeah, so, I, yeah, go ahead, then. No, I was just going to agree with Antoine that I think that's uh, that's an important question that we need to be able to answer in order to you know get the network utilization high enough to really take advantage of all of the all of the things that we're doing here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I have a small question myself. I <clears throat> I, um, I was wondering, you know, in all your works that you mentioned, the switches. Uh, basically a yet another compute element or I would say some explicit entity that exists. It's not just, uh, is, it is not there for routing. It's not there for, uh, you know, sending packets. It's there for computing something. And uh, my question is, do you uh, kind of believe that the whole idea of programmable switches being part of distributed applications should be explicit entity that is programmed explicitly by the end user or by the programmer, or it should be kind of a, um, uh, I would call it transparent piece of hardware that does not require the applications to be changed. It just magically does some, uh, you know, for example, aggregation and figures out how to do this aggregation without modifying the whole system around it. And uh, it will just work. Like, do, do you actually think it's ever possible to, to, to get to that level of uh, transparency? Uh, so I think that what, what I would, the, the way I would think about this is that we, we've thought about applications where uh, we're getting a benefit from putting uh, the computation close to the network, uh, often in a case where we can, you know, process multiple packets at once or send out multiple packets to different sources in response to, um, in, in response to a, a, a single input. And in terms of, uh, you know, whether this is something that's being transparent, whether this is something that's application specific, um, one of the things that I th I've been thinking about a lot, um, particularly as we look at how to uh, deploy some of these things at Microsoft is like, what, what is the right uh, abstraction for separating the computation logic from the networking and from whatever has happening in, in, on the end hosts? Um, and I think in a lot of cases, uh, you really want to standardize the particular primitives uh, so that you have a well-defined operation like aggregation, um, just as a matter of you know getting that get, getting that deployed and making sure that it, it that we don't have to fundamentally change the way the network works every time we change the application. Um, and obviously, there's a tension there because a lot of the things the power we're getting, it comes from uh, the flexibility of the underlying hardware. And um, if our deployment model sacrifices that, we have really lost something. Like for example, um, what, as we do in network aggregation, we found that it was really useful to be able to explore different ways to represent the f floating point integers. 
which would be something that you know you couldn't do if you had to go through an IEEE standardization process um, in order to talk about these things. Um, so I think there is a fundamental tension there. So uh, I guess I guess my my uh, sort of main point is that by cross cutting through protocols, you sacrifice portability and uh, basically mix up all this, as you mentioned, network logic and application logic. And uh, is it uh, inevitable, you think, or it's just something that, you know, in the beginning of this whole trend and, and therefore we're still there, but in the end we will figure out how to actually break it uh, in a more strict way. I think that when it comes to um, using network devices and as using in network computation, we are gonna see that as fundamental because uh, it really is tied to the way the network works, the protocols that we're using, uh, and that implies a certain level of complexity that isn't necessarily there um, for uh, general uh, use of accelerators. It's also possible that we can use the same devices you know, in a, in a different way uh, to not place the computation into the network, but just use the devices as accelerators you know, servers that happen to be extremely good at processing packets on the 3200 gig ethernet ports they happen to have on the front, but that are not actually really part of the network fabric itself. Um, that's actually something we're looking into because that's a way to, that, that's a way to get things deployed a lot more easily. Um, and it does support some of the applications that we're really interested in at the moment um, at MSR. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, any other? Okay. Uh, yes, there is one more. Uh, yes, Shai, go ahead. Um, hi, Dan. Great talk. Um, just a quick question. Um, so, in the future, you're probably envisioning the use of uh, smart switches and also smart NICs. Now, smart switches have the ability to um, have a global view of the overall system while smart NICs are kind of bound to a single machine. Do you right. see the benefits of each one as um, orthogonal or if you combine them together, you can have some sort of um, much higher benefit, um, let's say more consolidation between the machines themselves and the global view of the network? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, I do see them as, uh, as, I mean, I see them as separate things, but that, that, that do have a benefit together. Um, and as you said, you know, the question is whether it's useful to have something that's tied to one host versus uh, a cent central point of, of communication in the network. Um, but I, I sort of see the purpose of the smart NIC as being able to provide um, the, network band the, the network bandwidth that you would want um, on in, in order to keep the processing capability of a single machine satisfied. Um, and as we build machines that have large network connections, that's a really uh, complicated thing to do that may uh, require custom logic. Um, obviously, we've, we've seen smart NICs used for network virtualization uh, because that's a way to do this kind of complicated transformation um, much faster and much more efficiently. But I think you know we will also see them being used to do protocol transformation uh, in a way that improves the overall efficiency of the system as we start having very fast network links. For example, offloading um, the serialization and deserialization of um, network protocol messages, uh, protobufs, things like that, or reformatting messages to get in general to get from a representation that's convenient to the end. Uh, the end host and one that's convenient to the network. I mean, in particular, you know, if, if we're thinking about in network computation, uh, one of the challenges we really run into is that uh, we need to make sure that um, each packet is corresponds to a unit that is useful to communicate to, to uh, compute on. And that's something that's not uh, true in general of applications that are just accessing the network directly, but uh, using a programmable NIC in order to um, reformat the data could be quite useful there. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Dan, you have a whole, you have a few questions on Slack. I will uh, 
encourage you to join in and, and, and actually answer them uh, later offline. Uh, I believe your talk will be also available if you don't mind putting it online.